and welcome back to the Wednesday, May the 18th edition of the Bottom Line Lexington podcast. You know it's a slow day in sports when the third headline on ESPN.com is about a soccer player signing a contract with Chelsea in Europe. Sounds exciting to me. Locally this morning, Charles Matthews of Kentucky Basketball announces he's transferring. You can read a lot of things into this. Does Matthews think he's a better player than what he really is? Is this a sign that there's a lot of people coming back, i.e. Isaiah Briscoe, i.e. Marcus Lee? Is that Bolden kid from Texas, is he going to have a scholarship now? You can read a lot into this. For the present, what do we really have? What did Kentucky really lose by this kid leaving? He played in all 36 games last year, averaged 10.3 minutes a game. I was shocked by that. I didn't think he played that much, to be honest with you. In 10 minutes a game, He averaged 1.7 points, 1.6 rebounds. So for you math majors out there, if he played 30 minutes a game, he'd get about 5 points and 5 rebounds. He shot 44% field goals. He shot 41% free throws. And for me, the most telling number of all, player efficiency rating. And this rating does not count how many minutes you play per game. This is about what you do when you're on the court. His PER was 9. Whereas an average PER is in the high teens. The only players he was ahead of for Kentucky, Mulder, Florial, David. That's it. I don't know what this kid was like in their locker room, but on the court, you're not going to miss anything by Charles Matthews leaving this program. And especially if he opens up a scholarship for all these other guys to come back. So for me, no harm, no foul. If he doesn't want to be here, let him go. Maybe he's delusional enough to think he can score 15, 20 points a game in another school. More power to him. More news yesterday that Cal, Coach Calipari now will have a 30 for 30 documentary based on him coming up this fall. ESPN's not stupid. They see the ratings. They know what happens when they show Kentucky basketball. Those ratings are through the roof compared to the other games that they show that do not involve Kentucky basketball. So why not placate one of their largest fan bases? My thing is this, though. In this 30 for 30, how much will be focused on how much Calipari has changed the game, how much he has changed recruiting, and the incredible job he's done off the court while at Kentucky, how much he did to make UMass a viable program, how much of it will be spent on that, and how much of it will be spent on when he was assistant under Larry Brown. Larry Brown, a man who has put not one, not two, but three schools under NCAA probation. How much of that will be when he was assistant for Paul Evans? Paul Evans, who put his school, Pittsburgh, on probation. How much of this will be focused on his time at UMass and the fact that they had to vacate their Final Four appearance? Not to mention that press conference with John Chaney where Chaney says he's going to kill him. That's funny stuff. How much of this will be focused on his time at Memphis where they had to vacate that Final Four appearance? Not to mention blowing a seven-point lead with less than two minutes to go. How much of this will be focused on how many total wins does he actually have? University of Kentucky says he has this many total wins. The NCAA says he has a less total because of the vacated wins. Depending on who directs this, we'll tell you which direction this is going to go. Will it be a fluff piece or will it be hard hitting? To be honest, I'd rather see the hard hitting one myself, but that's just me. Man, did you see that Reds game last night? Well, if you did, I I apologize in advance for you wasting three hours of your life. 13 to 1. The Reds take it on the chin in Cleveland. That's 28-7 to combined in two games. It's the first time the Reds have allowed 13 runs or more in two consecutive games since they went to Colorado in 1997. By the way, 1997 in Colorado, not only were the balls juiced, but that was before they brought out the humidor. That's when Larry Walker was hitting like 375. Todd Helton was hitting like 350. <laughs> they were matching it. That was Larry Walker's MVP year. Reds still only three wins on the road for the year. Still last in baseball. We might have seen the end of the road for two pitchers last night. Alfredo Simon, back to his old ways. Four innings, 10 earned runs, 14 hits. How do you leave a pitcher in that's give up 14 hits? What do you say after like nine or 10 hits? Ah, maybe he'll find his stride here. 14 hits and four innings. ERA, 10.34. By the way, that ERA is down from where it was two weeks ago. And it just looked like he didn't care. One time they hit a ball on the ground to the right side. He didn't cover first. 
He wasn't interested in holding base runners. That was a sad effort from Alfredo Simon. If he makes his next start in the rotation, I'll be shocked. You can't run that guy out there again. You just can't. Someone named Steve Delabar came into the game after that. You've got the bases loaded. What does Steve Delabar do? Not one, not two, not three, four straight walks with the bases loaded. That's four runs. <laughs> How do you leave that guy in? He, well, at least he got two outs, made it to the end of the inning, but he walked five guys. It wouldn't shock me by the weekend to see that guy in Louisville and Simon on the streets. Sheesh. Sometimes you just can't blame this mess on the manager. I don't like Brian Price. I think he is a horrible manager. But he doesn't have the ammunition in this gum fight to compete. Just like Freddy Gonzalez got fired in Atlanta yesterday. We actually had talked about it on this show yesterday morning before he was fired. We said he and Brad Ausmus were in the running to the first one to be fired yesterday. This is starting to look a lot like the Houston Astros. They lost 100 games three years in a row. Then last year they made the playoffs. The difference with the Astros is they were cultivating a minor league system. They had a great general manager, still do, Jeff Lunau, who was with the Cardinals, went to Houston. They've built that from the ground up. I don't see the Reds doing that. To blame Brian Price for this is wrong. I blame him for a little of it because he's horrible at managing his bullpen when they're in competitive games. But you can't do anything in a 13-1 to game. There's nothing good about this team right now. Nothing. And now... And now they're on pace for 100 losses. Keep it up, Reds. The seed shifts to Cincinnati tonight as Cleveland will visit Cincinnati in this Ohio Cup. I guess they play four games, and then the winner at the end of the four gets a trophy. Who knows? Who cares? Cleveland, Mike Clevenger will pitch tonight. His first major league start, minor league ERA 3.01. And this shows you how respected the Reds are. Cleveland's a slight favorite tonight with a guy making his first major league start on the road. Brandon Finnegan will go for the Reds, 4.40. If there's a saving grace for the Reds tonight, on the road, Cleveland as a road favorite, they're 5-7. And, and at home, the Reds are 12-10. and 10. They actually have a winning record at home. Can you believe that? Well, it just speaks volumes to how lousy they've been on the road. If there's a night to bet on the Reds, this is it. But I won't be with you. I don't want to go against a pitcher making his first major league start because if you ever notice, and you'll notice this with, with every team, no matter who it is, when a kid makes his first start in the majors, everybody from the manager on down wants to make sure that that kid gets a win, and they'll do whatever it takes. So that's a little trend, a little strategy that I don't like to buck. Otherwise, I'd probably take the Reds tonight. But if you do, enter at your own risk, my friend. NBA Cleveland last night beats Toronto by 31 points. Wasn't even that close, to be honest with you. This series will go five. Maybe four, but I'll say five. The gentleman's sweep, as we like to say in the business. I was interested to see that Mayor John Tory was upset with CBS because they put out a poll on their website asking fans who they thought would win the NBA championship. And their choices were OKC, Golden State, Cleveland, or other. Really? You couldn't put Toronto there instead of other? And it wasn't like this was four weeks ago when the playoffs started. This was this weekend. Got to put other? Can't put Toronto? Yeah, that was kind of a cheap shot by CBS. Or a lazy social media employee. One or the other. Tonight, Golden State will try to get back in this series. Golden State, eight and a half point favorite. I would love to take OKC tonight, but they won the first game. You could Use that zigzag theory. It's Oklahoma State tonight. Then again, I'm not laying eight and a half with anybody. I'll pass on this game. Golden State will probably win, though. Go back to OKC, tied 1-1. NBA draft lottery last night. Yippee. What? 30 of the best minutes of television every single year. That show is unwatchable, by the way. Heather Cox, Mark Jones, I don't know who lets them go to this thing, but they do it every single year. It's the worst half hour of television ever. The fact is, you don't need to make that a half hour show. Just show us who picks where and be done with it. You can do it between the first and the second quarter of an NBA game. Mark Jones always on his game, though. Last night, usually he has these little tidbits between picks. As the picks are being announced in order, and Mark Jones will say, like, the NBA guy will say, the next pick will be the Sacramento Kings. And then Mark Jones will say, like, under his breath, Sacramento plays their games in the capital of California. That's literally what he gives you. Now, he did better last night. I think people finally caught on to the fact that he wasn't giving you much. But, I mean, it used to be stuff like, the next pick goes to the Phoenix Suns. The Phoenix Suns play in the warmest climate in the NBA. 
<laughs> it's like that. The next pick goes to the Utah Jazz. The Jazz ended the season on fire, winning 13 of their last 33 games. That's the kind of stuff that you usually get. But this year, it was so complicated, so many traded picks, so many all this, he couldn't focus on giving those little tidbits that he's so known for. Go back on YouTube, because these draft lotteries are on YouTube. Go back on there and find the old draft lotteries and listen to Mark Jones, who's literally been doing this broadcast, I know, for 15 years. The same thing. And listen to the little facts that he gives between announcing picks. It's mind-numbing. But hey, don't knock a man's hustle. He's got a gig. So the 76ers won the draft lottery. Dikembe Mutombo, the finger wagger himself, came out yesterday afternoon on Twitter and said congratulations to the 76ers for winning the lottery. Huh, how did he know? Maybe I need to get Mutombo to help me with my picks at the end of the show. Sixers win, Lakers second, Celtics third. Yippee. Where does Ben Simmons go? Is he a malcontent? Can he shoot a jump shot? Blah, blah, blah. Chad Ford on ESPN today, his latest projections have Jamal Murray going third to Boston, Scalabissier going 11 to Orlando. Unbelievable. How in God's name could any NBA team take that kid 11th? I'm sorry. What's he done in the last two months? The last time I saw Scalabissier, you know what he was doing? Getting dominated by Indiana. And now two months later, he's a lottery pick. Unbelievable. What's he been doing? He's been playing alone in an empty gym, running up and down, shooting jump shots, and everybody loves him. Unbe- oh, I'm just telling you, six points, three rebounds a game. I've beaten that dead horse too much already. And Tyler Eulis going 15 to Denver. Quick, name three players for Denver. Kenneth Fareed, some people around here know. Yeah, exactly. Alex English, Kiki Vandaway, Dan Issel. As we mentioned earlier in the show, my beloved Atlanta Braves fired their manager yesterday, Freddie Gonzalez. But it was funny, they fired him. The reason, the way he knew he was fired is because the team told the airlines to reschedule his flight. So the airline sent Freddie Gonzalez a confirmation email about his rescheduled flight to go back to Atlanta. That's how he knew he was getting fired. Only the Braves, only the corporate Braves could pull off a stunt like that. When I was a Braves fan in Atlanta in the 90s, it was Ted Turner. It was top shelf. John Sherholtz. I mean, it was top of the line all the way around. Now, it's a joke. And they say they're trying to do this restructuring like the Astros did and be good for years to come. And they probably will. Because they've done a much better job at rebuilding than the Reds have. And they go into a new stadium next year. But these last couple of years going into that new stadium have been god-awful. It's not Freddy Gonzalez's fault that in 38 games this year, they've hit 13 home runs. Nolan Arenado of the Rockies has hit 13 home runs. Speaking of home run leaders, Todd Frazier of the White Sox, he's hit 12 home runs this year. Now, he's only hitting 228, but still, he's hitting the ball out of the ballpark. What did the Reds get in all that mess for last year for Todd Frazier? Scott Shebler, who's already played for the Reds, already been to the minor leagues by the Reds, and has a career average of 210. Nice trade again, Reds. They can't all be Adam Duvall, right? Suspensions coming down yesterday. Rough Dead Odor of the Rangers got eight games for his brawl with Jose Batista, who only got one game. Let me get this straight. You bet. You flipped your bat last year. Then you get plunked. Then they knock you out, and you still get a game suspension. Batista should not have gotten a game. Odor should have gotten 20. They were light on him. Ridiculous. My thing is, how does Batista get a game? He's the one that got knocked out. I digress. Football news. Michael Bennett of the Seahawks was talking with reporters yesterday, said he will not hold out, but more importantly, was talking about Eagles quarterback Sam Bradford and how his issues make him throw up, calling him an ingrateful loser because he's going to make $40 million a year backing up as a quarterback for the next two years, and he's still complaining about it, which is true. Bradford will sit on the bench this year and make $22 million. All he has to do is have a pulse and show up to work on time. And after this season, Sam Bradford will have made $100 million in the NFL. Eagles new quarterback Carson Wentz was asked if he had talked to Bradford yet, and he said, yes, we only talked about football. I'm sure. I'm sure Sam Bradford was willing to help him in any way possible. These quarterbacks, man, I don't, it's funny. When the Packers drafted Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre was like, I'm not talking to that kid. He's trying to take my job. I get that. 
But that's Brett Favre. Sam Bradford, you're no Brett Favre. Although, the wide receivers for the Eagles have been in camp with both quarterbacks now, and the receivers say they want Sam Bradford. I don't understand that. More football. I was looking. Now that the Reds stink, basketball is almost over, the long, hot summer is coming up, you start thinking about college football if you're a sports fan. If you're looking at the week one matchups in college football, you usually don't see anything like this, but these are pretty good. Some matchups to look at. Oklahoma and Houston, LSU-Wisconsin, Georgia, North Carolina, USC, Alabama, Clemson, Auburn, Notre Dame, Texas, and Ole Miss and Florida State. That's a pretty good Labor Day weekend of college football. Looking for a potential upset in those games? I'll give you two words. War Eagle. But that's a long way off to call a Mac Daddy Stogie pick. Just plant the seeds of discontent in your mind until then. We don't like to talk recruiting news here on this show, but uh, this one caught my eye. Michael Porter Jr. is a top five-star, all-American, whatever you want to call it, high school player going into his senior year, and he's being heavily recruited by the University of Washington. University of Washington is like Michael Porter Jr. is in high school, huh? What about Michael Porter Sr.? Well, Washington says, hey, hey, Michael Porter Sr., how would you like to be an assistant coach? Porter Sr. accepts the job. You don't think Michael Porter Jr. is going to follow him to Washington? You're crazy. I've seen this a lot. In fact, I saw Danny Manning Sr. get a job at Kansas to make sure Danny Manning got there. Something tells me the last game he coached was the last game Danny Manning played at Kansas. In fact, I'm sure it was. So great job, Washington. Cost you a position with the on the coaching staff, but you got your man. Speaking of being bored in the long, hot summer... If you're looking for a game to go to this year in Cincinnati, it's probably not going to be the Reds. It's going to be their soccer team. They had 20,000 people show up for a soccer game the other day. I've heard about this soccer revolution ever since I was a kid. But if you look at these TV rights, soccer's going for as much as anything right now. Don't worry. Every game still ends up one to nothing anyway. Don't talk a lot of hockey on this show, but there's a story that caught my eye. Fans of the St. Louis Blues... The Blues being in the conference finals right now for the Stanley Cup. Fans of the Blues have been, how shall we say, fired up by something that's called hashtag rally boobs. A woman named Emily Rothschild has season tickets right behind the St. Louis Blues bench. And every time the television camera shows a close-up of the coach, you can see Emily Rothschild's shall we say, ample breasts on full display. Now, Emily Rothschild is like, I saw a picture of her in full. She's, I would say, in her 30s, possibly close to 40. But let's just say she wears a revealing shirt. And now that she has made some news, everybody's like, hashtag rally boobs every time they see her on television. Now, Miss Rothschild is upset. She says, I've had those tickets, those season tickets for seven years. Now I feel degraded. I feel like the St. Louis Blues owe me something. Oh, Lord. Then why why are you wearing such a revealing shirt? Go Google St. Louis Blues rally boobs, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm sure the Blues just became the favorite out in Las Vegas for the rally boobs alone. Ah, uh, it's must-see TV this week on, on Jeopardy as the celebrity Jeopardy version of the show is being shown. And yes, I will make my obligatory Sean Connery suck at Trebek comment here. But last night, Anderson Cooper, Michael Steele, and Laura Logan, three reporters, were asked a question about football. And the answer was, this Carolina Panther quarterback set a rookie record for passing yards in his rookie season. None of the three geniuses on the panel even buzzed in. And you can make your joke, well, Laura Logan is a girl. Well, Anderson Cooper is gay. But if you want to be like that, Michael Steele's a big black guy. You'd you think at least he would know. Celebrity Jeopardy again, exposing people for what they are. At least they didn't answer a penis mightier or anal bum covers. Google it, kids. It's pretty funny. All right, it's time for our Mac Daddy Stogie Picks, and we're on fire, ladies and gentlemen. We went 3-0 and last night. Three underdogs, three straight-up winners. If you went with those games, congratulations. I hope you smoked a nice cigar like I did last night, right after that last out was made. We got two games for tonight. Seattle, 
22 and 16 goes to Baltimore, 23 and 14. Two contending teams at this point. Baltimore, about a minus 115, minus 120. So you get Seattle about plus 110, plus 105. Seattle won this game 10 to nothing last night between the two teams. You've got Taiwan Walker for the Mariners, 2.63. Chris Tillman for the O's, 2.58. Orioles have been a big overachiever so far this year. Mariners didn't use anybody out of their bullpen that meant anything, like their 7th, 8th, or ninth inning guys. This team, as a road dog this year, the Mariners 12-4. and four. That is a great stat. I've got the better pitcher. I've got the better team. Give me the Mariners tonight getting odds against Baltimore. Taiwan Walker over Chris Tillman. One more. We'll go back to Toronto. Toronto's lost four games in a row. And send out knuckleballer R.A. Dickey tonight, 4.31. Never know what you're going to get from him. Tampa tonight, 18-19. Jake Odorizzi, 3.83. Odorizzi faced Toronto on May the 1st. Went seven innings, gave up one run. Now, his team lost the game, but he still had a good outing. So he's proven that he can stop Toronto. Toronto, 8-12 at home. A pitcher who's proven he's good against Toronto. Give me the Rays and Odorizzi tonight. You're getting about plus 115, plus 120. So you're getting nice odds against R.A. Dickey. Seattle and Tampa, your two Mac Daddy Stogies of the night. Take those to the desert and smoke them. And that's it for the Wednesday, May the 18th edition of the Bottom Line Lexington podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Follow us on Twitter at Bottom Line Lex. Email us anytime, bottomlinelex at gmail.com. And make sure to follow this YouTube channel. Thanks again, and until next time, may the winners be yours.